right. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Um, good evening. Thank you. Uh, if you wanted to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, that's where we're going to park most of our time here tonight, and we'll get started here in just a moment. All right. I'm so excited to be with you guys here tonight, and um, for those of you that were not here last week, week one, we had our beloved pastor Aaron Sabio talk about spiritual warfare as it relates to this topic that we're looking at this month called an empowered spiritual life. And tonight I'd like to take a look at going deeper with that and kind of looking at and examining the life of Jesus and how he lived in this place of empowerment, this spirit-filled life. And so that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to turn our gaze upon Jesus. And you notice know, as we were singing the last song there that we're a child of God, just reminded about how the Father wants to father us tonight. That he wants to father us by turning our eyes towards his son. He said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I'm excited when I think about that because Jesus brings us to the Father. I've shared this before, but tonight I think he wants to do that in another deep way where he wants to show us what it is to live a spirit-filled life as we turn our eyes to Jesus and how he lived a spirit-filled life. And so if you're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I got a couple questions for you, a little interactive here. How many of you like to run? A few of us, okay. All right, all right. How many of us would rather watch someone else run? That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Okay. Wherever you're at on that, that's okay. We're going to talk a little bit about running tonight. But um, if you're like me, I love the Olympics. You know, this is the off year, right? It happens every four years. And I'm kind of bummed because usually the Olympics are taking place at this time of the year, right? But one of my favorite events, and probably the favorite events of, of most out there, is got to be the 4x4 or 4x100 relay race, right? How many of you are all big fans of the 4x100? Yeah, I mean, it's just exciting, right? I mean, it is, it is the most elite of the elite runners on the face of the planet, right? The fastest of the fastest a race that honestly takes about 45 seconds. And if you're familiar at all with the relay race, the way it works is you have four men, four women, or if you will, depending on which, who's racing, and these runners all hand, um, or a baton, or in my case, a PVC pipe. Um, and so they hand this thing, this baton, to one another, and as they do, they, they hand this off in a, in a zone called the exchange zone. Now, Christine Kane, in one of her talks uh, called Passing the Baton of Faith, uh, talks on this great deeply, so I'm going to steal from her for, for a moment, so I'll give her credit on this. She talks about this thing called the exchange zone. The way the exchange, exchange zone works, it's, it's about a 20-meter, is all it is, uh, zone in which they have 20 meters to hand this baton from one runner to the next runner. Usually, it's done within two seconds. It's lightning quick. If they pass it outside of the exchange zone, either before or after the team is disqualified. Everything hinges upon the exchange between these runners. There's four runners, there's three exchanges, and it has to be absolutely seamless. If you haven't had a chance to watch it, I encourage you to watch it. It is just an, an absolute art of beauty. And we're going to talk about this idea of an exchange zone, uh, but I want to kind of tell you a little bit about some history behind it, because I think it kind of sets the tone for where we're going at. Um, I love watching the 4x100, as I said before. Um, the women's team has been phenomenal. Since the inception of the modern Olympics, they have been a powerhouse. Uh, during the 90s, they just ran away with it, but in 2000, there's a turn made, uh, a new trajectory, a trajectory that they wouldn't have wanted. You see, in 2000, in Sydney, the women's 4x4 100 team was the fastest team on paper. And this is something they were, they were accustomed to. They were, they were expected to be the best of the best. They were expected to win. And in Sydney, some of you might remember this Olympics here, on one of the exchanges, there was a sloppy exchange, a sloppy exchange between a couple of runners, and they end up coming in third. And they failed to achieve the Olympic gold. For them, it was a complete, even though they were on the stand, a uh, third place just, just didn't cut it for them. Fast forward four years, 2004, we're now in Athens, right? Some of you might remember this. In Athens, again, the fastest team on paper, the women's 4 by 100 team, would blow everybody out of the water. But on the second, excuse me, on the second exchange, um, uh, pardon me, let me look at my notes here. Um, Marion Jones, maybe you remember that name, right? Day before that, right, she had jumped, she had long jumped 11 times. She's super tired, right? This, this is something always they're a concern about when they're running is the different events and when, they, and when they do these events. But the day before, she had jumped 11 times. But during her exchange, 
She was passing off to her partner, Lauren Williams, and she was so exhausted and so tired, she couldn't quite get the baton into the hands of her teammates, so that by the time she passes it to her teammate, she passes it outside of the exchange zone, right? The team is disqualified. They fail to win the Olympic gold. Fast forward four more years to 2008, Beijing. Some of you all remember this. Beijing, again, fastest on paper, the 4x100 women's team, hands down, they're the fastest out there. Everything is going well up into the third exchange. They're well ahead. But in the third exchange, they drop the baton. Right? And the U.S. team goes home losers. And once again, in absolute defeat, they fail to take home the Olympic gold. Now, the good news is, is four years later, some of you will recall that in four years later in, um, in London, that is, let me look at my notes here, in London, they take home the Olympic gold, right? Everything went smoothly. Every single exchange was exactly seamless, and they take home the Olympic gold so much so that they break a 20-year record, and the U.S. wins. I'm expecting you guys to cheer right now, but I guess, all right, so I get excited. I get excited. Go USA. You know, they win again in 2016, and in 2020, the Jamaican team wins. If you know anything about the Jamaican team right now, they're the hot team. But if you follow women's 4x100, you know that two months ago, right, the U.S. upset Jamaica, right, and they won the world championship. There you go. Thank you so much. They won the world championships. Where are you going at with this, Rick? I'm so glad you asked. What was in key for me when I watched this 2022 World Championships a couple months ago was what one of the commentators had to say. In one of the exchanges, right during his commentating, he was watching as one of the U.S. women handed to the other U.S. woman the baton, and he said, it took longer than it should have. And that caught my attention because I had remembered the history of this women's 4x100 when everything was done uh, so quickly and quite honestly, uh, just kind of haphazardly. And in this particular case, I thought to myself, man, you got it wrong. In fact, I would submit to you that the extra time that they took to ensure that the baton was handed right correctly meant that this led to the winning time. Extra time led to the winning time. I'd like to submit to you tonight that the church is in an exchange zone. Our church today is in an exchange zone. We're in a place of absolute, a critical period in our time. We're in this place where there's a lot happening in a short amount of time, and we're running a divine relay. And not unlike the exchange in a, in a relay race, I want to submit to you that it's how we leverage our time. It's how we leverage this, this, this time in this unique age in which we live of whether or not we're going to experience what we would call here tonight an empowered spiritual life. So tonight, I beg, begs the question, how are we running our race? How are we living our race. You know, we talked earlier about, you know, how many of us don't like to run, but the reality is scripture tells us is that we're all runners in this race, aren't we? Right? We're all running a race. Your race might be different than mine, but we're all in it, right? We're all in this race. And we may not run physically, but we all run a spiritual race with much, much greater stakes and much, much more at stake and much greater rewards. As we'll see, the question really becomes is how can we run our race um, knowing that we want to be living a powered life. Turn with me again to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And I love what Paul here writes. He writes in verse 24, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, right? There's a divine relay race here, and we've got 100 people. We're all running our leg here. But only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Paul continues on in verse 25. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last or endure forever. Verse 26. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. and I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I will not be disqualified for the prize. The idea that Paul's making here is not the idea that there's just one prize and we're in competition together as Christians over that prize, but rather there's a race that we're all running. And listen to what he says here, that it's about running in such a way. I'd like us to think about that tonight. How are we running our race? Are we running in such a way as to win the prize? Not against one another, not in competition with one another, not as if there is only one prize. The Bible says there's a crown of life awaiting all, for all of us who trusted in Jesus. But the idea being is we're to run in such a way. 
I think if you're like me, sometimes when I go running, I can run just kind of carelessly without really thinking about where I'm going, maybe even, or how fast I'm running. I'm just kind of running. And that, that's just fine. That, that's fine. But when it comes to a spiritual life, time is of the essence. We're given 24 hours. Each one of us has 24 hours. The amount of days we don't know, God knows the number of days. But I ask us to think about this because I believe that when we run in such a way, it's then that we can live an empowered spirit life. And that's what we're gonna focus on tonight. If you'll bow your heads for me with a minute, I wanna go ahead and be how important this is. I wanna pray for you about this. I wanna pray for us about this here right now. If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Jesus, we thank you for showing us the way, for showing us a way in which to run, for showing us what that destination is, for leading us, Lord, for shepherding us. Lord, I pray tonight that you would shepherd us into a place of what it is to run, and to run in which to win the prize. Take us down the path of righteousness tonight, Lord. Lead us beside the still waters. Show us the way tonight, Jesus. You are the way. We ask it in your name. Amen. So the title of our message is Run in Such a Way. And there's three things I'd like to, three, three big points I'd like to make here tonight. Number one, I'd like to talk about what I believe is the most critical, and I want to present to you or submit to you what I believe is the most critical issue we face in running our way in such a way as to live a spirit-filled life. I want to talk about an issue that I believe is, is pervasive throughout our entire culture here in America, if not the world, and how this issue really is what hinders us from running a race effectively. Secondly, I want to look to Jesus. I want to look at Jesus' cadence in which he ran and how he ran in order to live an empowered life. And then thirdly, I'd like to take it deeper and then bring it into some application and talk about how we can apply some of those disciplines and strict training that Jesus underwent in order to live an empowered life. Sound good? Yeah. All right, good deal. So point number one, you might be wondering, what's that critical issue? I believe the most critical issue facing the church today, facing our world today, in living just a sane life, right, let alone a spiritual life, is the issue of hurry. Let me say that again. I believe that the critical issue facing our church today um, is a form of spiritual warfare for certain, but it isn't sin. It's not maybe a particular addiction. I believe it's hurry. And I'll talk a little bit about tonight, but why I think it's the issue of hurry. But unlike any other time in our history, think about this for just a minute, unlike any other time in our history, dare I say we're living in unprecedented times, right? With the advent of technology and the pace of life, you layer COVID on top of that, we're living in an exchange zone like no other time in history. And how we live our lives and how we spend our time is of utmost importance. And so I preface that because in reading a book I'm reading right now, and this is, um, I'll give a shameless plug for a book here, uh, John Mark Comer's book, he calls it The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And as Rob asked me to kind of th consider what I'd like to share tonight, I'm just simply sharing with you what I feel like God's just been teaching me. One beggar sharing with another beggar where to find bread, or better yet, maybe one child sharing with another child where to find the goodies in the cabinet. And so I'm gonna largely borrow from a lot of his stuff, so I just wanna, just, just as a disclaimer, but I also wanna tell you just kind of the journey that I've been on, because it's not just been a, a one-time reading, but something I've really been chewing on a lot, because quite honestly, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, how should I say it this way, um, a hurry school dropout, right? Uh, I'm one that, that if, if I'm just quite transparent and honest with you here tonight, that this has been a struggle for me. Maybe for some of you here, this resonates with you as well. Then in hurrying, hurrying is one of those things you find in life that hinders all that you do. Your relationships, your purpose, your mission, maybe the effectiveness of your work. And so I want to just kind of lay that out tonight. In John Marks Comer's book, he calls it The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. I encourage you to go get that. So very little of what I shared tonight might be my original thoughts, although I do want to take you kind of along the journey I've been on in terms of what I think God has been teaching me and what I believe he's been preparing me here to share with you tonight. The reason I picked up this book, quite honestly, if I, can, if I may, is um, a friend and boss recommended it to me. You know when your friend and your boss recommend a book to you? <laughs> you know they have something to say, right? And so as I, as I listened in, I realized that what they were really saying is, hey, I love you so much, you need to read this. I see an area in your life and, and this is something that I really believe you need to hear. And when they said it that way, man, I couldn't help but just think, all right, Lord, 
here am I, right? I'm going to open my heart to you. And as I began to read this book, and again, because what I, what I saw in my life is I saw a person who was simply trying to, to do it all, someone who was trying to be industrious, as if that's really even a Christian, you know, uh, characteristic. But quite honestly, I was handling uh, multiple job responsibilities, coaching, overseeing home projects, doing ministry at the church and in the home, trying to be dad and you know, husband of the year, you know. Maybe some of you can relate, right? Trying to shove 40 hours into 24 hour time period. Uh, whatever that might look like for you, um, it's a similar story. It might be different activities, but I, I, I believe tonight that it's, it's probably a similar story though. Maybe different activities, but maybe the same story. Trying to do it all, fear of missing out, aiming for perfect, perfection, missing it all, must try harder, feeling disconnected from people, feeling maybe disconnected from your purpose in life, from God. And so I share that as all just kind of just a way for you to kind of maybe connect or a way for you to kind of sit in that space alongside of me because um, I don't believe I'm alone. I believe it's, it's the nature of our culture. It's the cadence we live in right now where it's go, 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 do, do, do. How much can you get through? You know, how, much can, how many things can I check off my list? In the midst of it, we miss it all. In his book, Comer recalls a story of his mentor, John Ortberg, whose mentor was a guy by the name of Dallas Willard. Ever heard of him, right? Pretty famous dude. And John Ortberg goes to Dallas Willard and he was in this season of life and he says, what do I need to do to live a spiritually empowered life? What do I need to do? And Willard in his way simply said, put away hurry. And John Ortberg kind of scratched his head and he says, but, 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 and, and what else? And what else? And John uh, Dallas Willard responds, there is nothing else. Hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life in our day. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Maybe that's a word for some of us here tonight. And I love that idea of ruthlessly, doing everything we can, straining, right? Like a person who's preparing for a race, ridding hurry. He defines hurry as a discomfort in which a person feels chronically short of time. Maybe you can resonate with this. Who feels chronically short of time and so tends to perform every task faster and faster and gets more frustrated when encountering any kind of delay. Anyone resonate with that, right? The interruptions of life, right? The people who stop you, right? The things that you don't get done and it just builds up, right? And there's this low-grade anxiety, a low-grade of sense of frustration, Corey Ten Boom once said, if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. You know, when you ask someone, you know, how you doing? Normally what people will say is good, just busy, right? And this becomes, once again, our narrative, as if this is just what everybody does. This is how everybody lives. We find ourselves in this, this current, if you will, of hurry, even unwittingly. Hurry is not just an or disordered schedule, John Ortberg says. He says that hurry is an evidence of a disordered heart and a disordered life. Man, that struck me hard. Struck me hard. So point number one in summary, busyness and hurry can disrupt the rhythm of our race. It's like the baton that gets dropped or we don't like quite have enough steam to get it to the next person or we just simply are disoriented. Point number two, let's look at Jesus we love looking at Jesus, don't we? What was Jesus' Jesus's cadence, right, as he ran in such a way, right, that is in which he wished to, uh, desired to live an empowered life? What did Jesus give his attention to? Was he in a hurry? Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 11, if you would. I'm going to move over a couple different passages here, but if you can turn in your Bibles to John chapter 11. Background real quickly here. You know the story, the death of Lazarus. Lazarus, Mary, and uh, Martha, uh, brothers and sisters, were super good friends of, of Jesus, right? They spent quite a bit of time together. They ate lots of meals together. You might even remember Mary was the one who uh, poured perfume on Jesus' feet, right, and wiped uh, his feet uh, with her tears and with this perfume, and so they were really intimately acquainted here. But in this particular story, things take a downturn. Pick it up with me in John chapter 11, verse 1. It says, now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, again, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one, again, who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. Verse 3, so the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When you have been wanted to be called the one you love, right? The one that Jesus loves. 
Verse 4, when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness, sickness will not end or culminate in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Verse 5, give special, special attention to this. Verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. No doubt about it. Verse 6, so when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he what? He stayed two more days. Now that's crazy. That is, I've read this before, but every time I read it, I'm like, did I read that correctly? I mean, let's be honest, most of us, right, if this was someone we deeply cared about, would have jumped in the car, where's the keys, right? We're laying rubber in the parking lot, we're gone, right? How can I help? But Jesus, because he's taking cues from his father in the times that he would gather together with him, says, hey boys, hey disciples, we're gonna wait here a couple of days. This is a strange thing to me when I think about Jesus' cadence and his timing on things. But it's interesting, some translations translate it this way, maybe yours does. Therefore, since Jesus loved them, he stayed two more days. He stayed two more days because he loved them. In the human understanding of things at the human level, that doesn't make any sense to me. And it's not until we read scripture later on that we understand that's exactly what he meant. That because he loved them, he waited two days. Jesus wasn't in a hurry because love's never in a hurry. Love's never in a hurry. It would have been very easy for Jesus to have simply responded to the needs and the whims of those around him and the circumstances. But he was taking his cues again from the Father. And he's like, boys, we're going to stay here two more days. Most of us know the story. I don't have time to unpack it all. But it's, it's, it's a couple of days later they leave. Jesus is like, now it's time. In fact, he gives an, he gives an a, if you look at the text there, by the way, it's really interesting, verses 9 through 11. He actually gives the analogy of light and dark. That is day and night, right? The times of the day. And he's like, now it's time. It's daytime. The one who moves about in the daytime doesn't stumble. It's time to go, boys. We're going to Judea. And I love it because the boys remind him, hey, um, Jesus, just remember, uh, that's where you were almost killed, right? You're stoned, right? Are you sure we want to go back there? But you know, love is never in a hurry, but love does whatever is necessary. William Barclay said that love is not love that carefully calculates the cost, but love is love when it gives all it has and its only regret is that it doesn't have more to give. This is, this is the cadence Jesus operated from. He operated from a place of love. I love that. Love has a perfect timing. And so more than simply doing what was expedient, which would have been, I think, to just have healed him, right? I mean, Jesus could have spoke the word. He had done that before, hadn't he, right? He didn't even need to go to Bethany. What would have been expedient was for him to just go, Lazarus, the one I love, of course, man, be healed. But Jesus does something so much bigger and so much grander. Some of us know the rest of this. I'm not gonna read it all to you. You can read it on your own. Jesus eventually goes to Bethany. He encounters Mary and Martha there. Lazarus has now uh, been in a tomb there for some days. He's been dead for four days, right? And he calls out Lazarus out of the grave, right? He, he resurrects Jesus, or resurrects Lazarus, pardon me. Jesus resurrects Lazarus to new life. And Jesus declares, I'm the resurrection and the life. He's not just healer. He's not able to just heal sickness and stop death, but he can give life, how much more, how much greater is his love? And I don't know what's going on in your life. I know for me, sometimes I wonder, what, God, what, what's going on? How, why is this happening? And where are we at with this whole thing? And the Father reminds me, let me just father you in this. Hear from me, sit with me, right? Run at my cadence, and as you do, I'm gonna give insight and understanding about what we're doing and when we're gonna do it, Amen. And so what we find in the story here is that this, the urgent is seldom important and the important is seldom urgent. Jesus isn't moved by the urgent. It might be urgent to everybody else, but he's moved by what's important. And so Jesus, I love this, he's so fiercely, and I love this word, fiercely present to people in circumstances. Uh, time will probably fail us to get much deeper here on, on this, but you know, there's stories of, of course, uh, Jairus and others, you know, and the woman there with the issue of blood flow, right? Where Jesus is, quote, interrupted, right? And he's able to pivot and he's able to just, at his own cadence, direct his attention to the person in front of him. 
Can we do that in our lives? Are we able to pause and pivot and be present to the people that God puts in front of us? C.S. Lewis talked about this in many of his books, but he talks that these interruptions aren't interruptions, they're life, right? And as we embrace those, as we walk according to Jesus' cadence, man, we begin to walk in this spirit world. Um, listen, um, I don't have time to get too much into this, but it's interesting when you start looking at time and you look at the advent of this exchange zone, I submit to you that this all took place in about the year 2007, this onset of this, quote, I'll call it exchange zone that we live in. Does anyone know what major event happened in 2007? Think technology. The advent of the iPhone, A plus for you, good job. But it wasn't just that. A couple months later, it was the platform setup of Facebook, the advent soon after that of something called Twitter, right? Intel switches from, of course, their uh, you know, silicon to their metal chip. All this happens in and about the year 2007. And from 2007, right, things begin to take a whole new, whole new course. We know, we've, I won't talk too much tonight about technology per se and what it does to disrupt our cadence. We know of its addictions. Science has, has backed this up and I'm not here to knock technology. There's a lot of great things about technology. And so I just ask you to kind of think about the way that this technology may, may interrupt your cadence, may interrupt your, your race, you know? We know that it steals our time and attention and it's intentionally designed to do so. Um, but I'm wondering how we manage that. How do we parent our, our phones, right? How do we parent our computers? It's interesting. There's a current trend out there. There's a science done on this. Uh, before the year 2012, you ready for this? It was said before the digital revolution, right before 2007, going back to 2000, that the attention span of the average human being was 12 seconds. You guys are doing much better than that. If I haven't put you to sleep yet, amen. It's about 12 seconds. After the year 2007, it dropped to eight seconds. The sad part of that is, is they've tested goldfish and goldfish have an attention span of nine seconds. We are beat, we've gotten beaten by goldfish, friends, right? Goldfish have longer attention spans than we do. We're losing to a bunch of goldfish. But you know, what is all this distraction, addiction, and pace of life doing to our souls? Scientists have now begun to call this hurry sickness and they've labeled it a disease. It's an actual thing, look it up. It's this idea that it affects both our physical but even our mental well-being. Right? That isn't surprising to many of us. Why? Because hurry kills relationships. Hurry kills love. Because hurry doesn't have time. Point number three. I think I'll skip this just for the sake of time. Point number three. Again, we've talked already again about what is the central, what I believe the central critical issue is in the church today that basically impedes our progress spiritually. Right? Would be hurry. Number two. We looked at some of Jesus' cadence, looking at the story there of Lazarus and so forth. Number three, how can we apply these practices of Jesus in order to run in such a way to win the prize? Well, of course, the answer simply, of course, is to look at Jesus. And so let's do that right now. Some of us know the passage all too well, but when Jesus says to his disciples after a time of a lot of busyness, right, a lot of work, he says to them, right, take up my yoke, right? Take up my yoke. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Many of us have studied this before, so I won't go into great detail, but yoke would be possibly, quite possibly the last thing you would expect, right, to put on someone, right, the burden when someone's already tired and downtrodden. But it's also interesting that the word yoke was really kind of a terminology used back in Jesus' day to speak of the rhythms of a particular rabbi, his teachings. So to take upon a yoke of an early rabbi in the early 20th, early first century was the idea is that you were taking upon his interpretations of the reading of the Torah, that you were taking upon his settings of teachings in order to be what it is to be human, right? His lens by which to see the world and his place in it on issues, everything from marriage and divorce to taxes and you name it. And so a yoke would be how you shoulder a load. Jesus' disciples or in the Hebrew Talmudim understood that to take up the yoke would be this idea of apprenticing yourself under Jesus, right? To bring your place yourself under a place of simply being under Jesus as a master and you being an apprentice. And I think it's really cool when you think that most disciples, if you chose to follow him in those days, would apprentice to Jesus under three things. So as we look at tonight, applying this, the way to organize your life, right? Under a particular rabbi, right? That is to yoke yourself with him. You would want to be like the rabbi, 
be with Jesus. Number two, become like Jesus. And number three, do what he would do if he were you. Let me say that again for those of you that are taking notes. If you are truly going to, quote, place yourself under the yoke of a rabbi, under his teaching, and submit yourself to him, right, as master, as teacher, you would try to be three things. Number one, be with Jesus or that rabbi. Become like Jesus and do what he would do if he were you. And the whole point of apprenticeship is simple. It's to recover your soul, to recover who you really are, right? That warped place of who you are being put back together. And Jesus often called this, right, living life to the full. Um, the New Testament writers call it salvation. That word, same word salvation, interestingly enough, is the word, the word that we get in the, in the Greek, soteria. It's actually the word healing. So whenever the Bible talks about this word, right, that uses this word, it speaks of both salvation, right, and healing. In fact, it comes from the Latin word salve, right, or ointment that you would give or you would put on for a burn or a wound. And so it's interesting that Jesus, in talking about his yoke, right, would also be this idea of applying healing to your body or salvation, right, or ointment to your body. In Matthew chapter 28, the passage we were referring to earlier, I love the way the Message Bible puts it. Are you tired? I ask you tonight. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Yoke with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Jesus offers us tonight, ladies and gentlemen, um, his yoke. An invitation is what that would. This, this yoke would be an invitation to apprentice ourselves under Jesus where we would assume this yoke where it's a yoke that is easy, a burden that is light, one in which we learn from him the unforced rhythms of life. Skip a few things here tonight, but the word he uses in this one passage here that we all know and love about abiding, it's interesting. It speaks of, most of us know it from John chapter 15 on this idea of Jesus being the vine, us being the branches. You remember the words, right? He says, abide in me and you will bear much fruit, right? For apart from me, you can do nothing, right? I abide in my Father's love, abide in me and abide in his love. I share that word because that word abide speaks of this idea of a rule of life. That's a weird phrase for us today. So we think of rules, most of us are disdain rules. But in, in, in early times, this idea of a rule of life or abiding, right, was this concept of uh, what, what we'd call a trellis, right? If I had a plant up here and I had a trellis, right, and I hung the vines on it, it would attach itself to this trellis. And so to have a rule of life, a way of living, a way of apprenticing yourself under Jesus would be to trellis your life to Jesus' life. To abide in him is this idea of abiding in the vine is that just like a trellis, it's not just to hold up a bunch of stuff, right? But it's also to bear fruit. So let's end tonight with this. We're escaping on time here and I'll end tonight. Um, in his book, he talks so much more about Sabbath, which I, had, I wish I had time to talk about tonight and slowing. Um, but let's talk tonight about silence and solitude as one of the disciplines that we can take away as application. Um, in Matthew chapter three, you might remember Jesus is being baptized and the father says to him, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. What immediately happens after the baptism? Jesus is led where? Into the desert. Look at the irony of that, right? Jesus, right, having received the commendation of his father is immediately led into a place of wilderness or into the desert. The word desert there, by the way, is translated in so many different ways, a wandering, deserted place, isolated place. Um, there's a lot of translations, but the idea there is that Jesus in the Greek is into a place called the Eremos. Say that with me, Eremos. The Eremos was this deserted, isolated, wandering place, and yet we're told that Jesus was led there by the Spirit. And that it's not a place of weakness, but rather a place where Jesus then was strengthened. We're told later on that he was strengthened by angels, right? After a period of time. And I believe much like the rest of Jesus' life, as he was taken to this desert wanderings, this place of isolation, the place to be with the Father, he was strengthened and empowered. And I ask us tonight, how are we spending that time? Are we 
cutting out time to be with the Father, to be with, to be with Jesus, to apprentice under him in such a way that just like he would get alone with the Father, that we would go away with the Father. The book of Solomon says it this way, come away with me, rise up my fair one and come away with me. Perhaps that's a word for some of you here tonight as the Father is wooing you, rise up my fair one and come away with me. Spend some time with me, yoke with me. This Eremos is an amazing thing. Jesus had this rhythm throughout his life. We're told in other places that he would rise up early, right? He'd go off to a place to pray. He'd climb up a mountain, right, and be alone. Uh, lots of passages. Um, but I think what I'd like to leave you with tonight is that, skip on down here, pardon me, is that wherever you might be at tonight, wherever you might be at in terms of a place of how you spend your time, as we want to live a life that is empowered, as we want to live a life in which um, God is working in our lives, in which we're running in such a way as to win the prize, I think it becomes incumbent upon us of how we're spending our time. Are we rushed? Are we in a hurry? Or is this cadence of life where, come what may, we're taking directive from the Father. We're hearing from Him first. We're spending time in order to hear from Him. And if you're like me, sometimes I think, man, I wish I would have, and I wish I could do. But you know, we can't do anything about the past. The past is history. Little to do about the future. It's a mystery. Today's a gift. That's why it's called the present. I would encourage you to be a person who lives right now in the present. A person who says, where can I, what can I do right now, right, in order to to just be in a place of just being loved by God, a place where we're already being loved by God, but a place where we can practice his presence. Brother Lawrence wrote a book called The Practicing the Presence of God, and he talked about it as being just that, a practice. Maybe there's some of you here tonight that go, this seems as, as unfamiliar to you as a man on the moon. I want to encourage you tonight that is, God is wooing you and calling him to himself, and he's talking about practicing the presence of himself, that you would just carve out some time and the end isn't solitude or the end isn't silence, but the end is, of course, to come back to our God and to who he's created us to be, amen? Paul says to make it an ambition to lead a quiet life. What's hard isn't following Jesus, right? With Jesus, there's still a yoke, a weight to life, but it's an easy yoke, and we never carry it alone. It's more resting than working, more about not doing than doing. That's hard for me, I'll be honest with you. But his is an easy yoke, and he's inviting you. He's inviting you to yoke with him, to meet with him. Will you remember tonight that we're in an exchange zone? Not of hurting, but of another way. Will you choose to apprentice yourself to Jesus and follow the way of unhurried love? Will you radically alter the pace and cadence of your life to take up the easy yoke of Jesus? I don't think, I don't think at all tonight that we can dismiss all the things that we need to do in life. I'm just wondering if we can do it more with a different pace. Amen? And when you fell, begin again, this time more slowly. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up here in just a moment. Um, as we do, I just feel led tonight um, without really much music being played. And silence is awkward, I know, for many. But I just invite you into the space tonight, just for maybe two minutes. For, for some of us, it'll seem like eternity. But as we come into this place of Eremos, a place of just kind of maybe just, for some of us, it'll be a complete wandering. Our minds are gonna spin out everywhere. <laughs> but a place of just settling our hearts, of slowing, of stillness, even though we're gathered here together, but of solitude. See what the Father might speak to you here tonight. Allow him to speak his words over you tonight. This is my son, this is my daughter in whom I'm well pleased. He loves you. He's got good things in store for you. You're his kin. Amen? I'm going to give us a couple of minutes to do that. I just encourage you to just find a place of just being still. Um, the worship band will start here in a minute. I'll pray for us here in a couple of minutes. However that works or looks for you, you're more than welcome to come up here and kneel. You can sit at your seat. You can kneel at your seat. But I just encourage you to just even surrender that uncomfortability of just being silent even, saying, God, I'm giving this to you. Come and meet with me. Amen?